And Kathy Zoe DOE, Assistant Secretary for Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure. And tell me, why did you ask the crowd today uh, to, to raise their hands if this was their first energy efficiency forum or the first one in two years? What, what kind of change have you seen in, in interest in this over time? Well, I feel like the, the, the energy efficiency sector is, is getting bigger. It's getting more centered as part of the debate in energy. I mean, I've been, I was trained as a geologist and an engineer, so I've been in the energy world for over 20 years. And energy efficiency has often been, as they say in Australia, the redheaded stepchild. It's one of those things that was an afterthought. It hasn't been considered a real significant source of energy. And now you've got all of this brain power going in. You've got all of this economic activity. And sometimes when you come to conferences like this, it's just the same old folks talking to each other. But you saw with the hands that went up, lots of people are new, and that's great. Um, you talked a lot about um, uh, going big and going in larger speed and scale. Was it was a big part of your talk today? You dropped a number that was two hundred two hundred twenty billion dollars per year. Is that savings that you can foresee? strictly in energy efficiency? Yeah, well, again, the McKinsey report said essentially there's 20% like of the energy that we consume now we could actually get rid of if we did efficiency things, and it would be cost effective to do that. And so uh, we simply just sort of did the math. So that's $220 billion of savings with, with really cost effective energy efficiency measures, if we got around to it, if we, if we turned our attention to it. Is any of this um, dependent on technology that perhaps does not even exist yet? No, that, that's, that's what's so f amazing. I mean, I think we've got, you could actually probably get somewhere between 50 and 60% with new and emerging technologies that might have a longer payback. But that 20% figure is really stuff that's quick payback, that's a good investment, that's going to save money, and it's available technology now. Um, you talked a lot about policy and uh, how to sort of how how can um, I guess federal government state government create a safe haven for investment and, and, and what, what do you think is the best way to get there are we talking about state energy efficiency uh, mandates or targets? Well I think there's a variety of tools so if you have appliance efficiency standards it basically gets the, the lousiest stuff off the market and that's a regulatory thing but it basically means that if you're a manufacturer of technologies you know where to invest your money in the next generation so that's one way. Building codes is another way that's sort of a local and state thing. Um, if we have a, carb a price on carbon at the national level, that's a very, very good signal that, set, that the private markets say, ah, there's going to be, it's, it's a better place to invest in, in, in um, energy efficiency and clean energy than it used to be. Uh, when it comes to efficiency, and, when we're, and we, you can distinguish from transport um, uh, from power, uh, how far do you see ener energy efficiency among everything, I, I guess, getting us there? Um, uh, I, look, I, I, I think if, if, we're, if we're talking about kind of a, an economy-wide cap on carbon, price on carbon. Energy efficiency is the thing that we're going to do first, that we need to do first. It's cost effective, it saves money now. It can be, I mean, again, if, if, we're, if, 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 if McKinsey's right, it's at least 20%, I think it can be much, much more than Towards that. Towards getting us to the goals? Absolutely, right? absolutely. Um, how, how fast do you think energy efficiency can get us where we need to go? Oh, I think it can be nearly immediate. I mean, you look at, I mean, we've been running some programs through the Recovery Act, the Low Income Weatherization Assistance Program, for example. For years, it was going along at about $200 million invested a year to help low income people um, reduce their energy consumption so, so that life would be more affordable. The Recovery Act ramped that up to a $5 billion program, so $200 million to $5 billion. That meant that those local community action agencies delivering that had to scale up phenomenally quickly. Well, last month they reached their target run rate. They have to be doing somewhere between 20 and 30,000 homes per month to be investing that money well, and they've, they've reached it. So my point being that they've trained more people, gotten more equipment, and are now out there doing the job. This is one of the reasons we're so excited about the Homestar legislation. We've got 1.6 million unemployed construct construction workers right now. We've got 80 million under-insulated or uninsulated homes. We've got residents, residential you know, householders who would like to be able to have lower energy bills. It's basically a perfect opportunity to put those things together to jumpstart a new sector of the economy in, in large-scale residential retrofit. How's the stimulus um, uh, money for EE? Is it, is it spent? Is it targeted? Is there more coming? Um, let's see. Well, my area has about, uh, let's see, uh, I've got about $17 billion in Recovery Act investment, but some of that is for renewable energy. So let's call it about $11 billion toward energy efficiency, and we're on track. 
we're on track. It's, it's really exciting projects. It's a combination of this low income weatherization, state energy projects, local governments getting involved in energy efficiency of local buildings like libraries and schools. Uh, it's uh, businesses doing the same sort of thing. It's a, it's a, it's a variety of, of sectors coming together, a variety of technologies, LED traffic lights. I mean, everywhere you turn, there's something efficient that, that's happening through the Recovery Act. The Gulf spill has really focused um, a lot of attention on transport. What do you think we can expect to see, uh, uh, and if you could speak to uh, any change needed in Americans' behavior um, in our cars in the future? Well, look again, we at the Department of Energy, we, you know, we're the largest R&D body in the world, and we invest a fair amount of research in different sorts of cars, different, different ways to improve internal combustion engines, hybrid electric vehicles. I mean, you know, we have a, a multi-billion dollar program in, in the real streamlining and the rapid development of, of the plug-in hybrid sector. We've got, you know, the president has said a million, a million plug-in hybrids on the road by 2015. And and that's, when, that's, when do we see the end of our dirty? Are we going to get out of our dirty SUVs and into more fuel? Well, efficient I think cars? I think we will because what we're what we'll see is a combination of improving technology and 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 cost reduction with with again with this ramp up. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, I was up in rural Vermont where at a ribbon cutting for a factory that's making a super efficient capacitor that fits onto a battery for an electric car. Now that company was about to move its operations over to China. But the Recovery Act came along, they got a $9 million grant, they're going to create 100 jobs and, and pioneer this new technology for our burgeoning electric car industry here in America. I mean, it's a, it, it's a story that has all of the pieces fitting together really, really beautifully. And just uh, ju just a comment about um, about buildings, because we, we hear so much, um, where, where is efficiency most effective? Is it is it in building new buildings and making them structurally more energy efficient? Because you talked a lot about retrofitting today. And, and is that is that the better sh uh, solution uh, short term? Well, I think I think that new buildings, building codes, design standards are absolutely essential. A lot of thought has been given to that. But the truth is we've got such a huge existing building stock that's already out there. And the lifetimes of these buildings, you know, is anywhere from 30 to 100 years you know, or more. We have an opportunity to turn our attention toward that existing building stock in a very cost-effective way, and I, you know that's just we're focusing our attention on it because it hasn't—it's been overlooked in the past. Mm -hmm. All right, Kathy Zoe, DOE, thank you. Pleasure.